Okay, hi to everybody. Um, welcome to my session, which is uh, titled How I Made My Motorbike Talk or How to Mix Amazon Lex, Amazon Lambda, and IoT to Give Life to Everyday Objects. My name is Tamburei Giordano, and let me start by introducing myself with just one slide. So I'm Italian, as you can hear by my almost perfect Oxford English. And um, yeah, I'm a bit of a nerd by, by genetics. Um, I'm originally a Java backend developer, and uh, I'm originally from Milan, even if um, I currently live in the beautiful Como, north of Italy. And uh, I've always been very, very passionate about software and motorbikes. And this is why I'm giving this talk today. So um, this talk is, uh, as you read from the abstract, is actually a story, a story of a project that I made in my free time. And everything started because I always wanted a motorbike. Um, for example, this is a 20 years old picture, I think, of me um, trying to ride with my sister my uncle motorbike, not knowing that the throttle gas is on the other side of the underboard. And uh, yeah, I always wanted a motorbike, but unfortunately, I couldn't afford it at the beginning. So I should uh, back up on uh, a bicycle, actually, for quite a long time. Or for other reasons, I couldn't buy a motorbike. I was always traveling. For example, I worked in Switzerland and then in the Netherlands for at least a couple of years. So I couldn't buy one. But then, in the end, finally, this year, I moved back to Como and I took my driver license. I started the process. I, I, I said I love bikes, motorbikes, but didn't know how to ride them. So I need to go through lessons and all the process for having a license. And finally, I had my license in less than two months. In the meantime, I met her. I met her. It was love at first sight. Uh, I immediately uh, brought her home. Um, but it was a kind of strange um, uh, relationship of love because it was unidirectional, only from me to her. And I was talking to her, but she wasn't replying to me, actually. So in a moment of grandeur, I finally decided to bring her to life such that she could reply to me and, you know, build a more healthy kind of uh, relationship between the two of us. And this is the birth of uh, this project, the Irene project, because the name of the motorbike is actually Irene. And, uh, yeah, to understand what I'm talking about, let's try to draw some I level requirements of the project. First, being a love relationship, uh, the heart of a good love relationship is, is communication. So I wanted be, to be able to communicate with the motorbike in every moment, at every instant. Uh, and the second good ingredient, well, not necessarily, is that uh, being a bit jealous, I wanted to know at every time where she was, where she's located in the world, right? Third very important requirements for me was that I want that she cares about me, right? So I want that, for example, in a case of a road accident, uh, she could detect the accident and alert uh, help on behalf of me if necessary. Very important requirements for me. And the fourth one was, well, um, I wanted that uh, she's loyal to me, of course. So I wanted to um, be able to forbid that she ran away with somebody else. So being able to detect if there is a thief or something around and being able to notify about those settings. And given these four high-level requirements, uh, basically I decided that a good way to implement them, to have them, was to build actually a, uh, a chatbot, a serverless chatbot on AWS technologies, combined with some uh, uh, IoT uh, technologies to actually uh, put the, 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 the computing power and the intelligence on the bike. Okay. So um, let me now show you um, a video to let you understand what I'm talking about. It's a four minutes video, so be patient.
back off, dude. Don't touch me. Run. Thank you. So I think you got an idea or on what uh, we are going to talk during the rest of this session. And this is a slide that um, gives you an overview of the architecture that I will describe. So um, as you can see on the left side, everything starts from the vehicle, which will have on board some hardware and will be interfaced uh, um, with GPS satellites to get the position. We'll have text-to-speech capabilities to actually say things loud. And then you will have other portion of the architecture in the cloud, in particular Lex, which is the chatbot intelligence, and integration with some channels and other uh, for messaging, like Skype, Scabby, or Slack. And then I also use some other third-party technologies, uh, for example, Google uh, Maps or uh, Open Weather. So let's start. First thing, I'm a software guy, so I want to get rid of hardware as fast as I can. So I'm going to start from there. And what is the hardware of Irene? Well, first, there is on board a Raspberry Pi, uh, Model 3B, installed under the saddle, as you saw. Uh, and this comes basically with, um, it's a Linux box. You know it for sure. It's quite powerful, very, very flexible, a lot of possible integration through USB and other or general purpose IO pins. On top of that, I've used a shield, a dedicated uh, Raspberry Pi shield called SenseHat that expand the Raspberry Pi with some sensors capabilities like gyroscope, accelerometer, magnetometer, temperature, barometric pressure, and humidity. You saw few of these sensors in action in the video, right? And the two things are combined very, very easily combined together because you just plug one into another. So really, off-the-shelf technology, you buy them on Amazon and you combine them very easy. On top of this stuff, which is basically the hardware, there are four additional hardware components. Again, off-the-shelf technology. You just buy them, get delivered them at your house, and you're good to go. First piece is GPS USB uh, sensor, OK? Yeah, off-the-shelf technology, nothing uh, dramatic. You just buy it. Then a mini speaker to let uh, Irene actually talk cloud. This is a mini speaker that is, is, is manufactured usually to attach it to your iPad or your iPhone, but it's good to go. You, you attach it to the Raspberry Pi audio jack, and that's it. Then um, you will need some power 
and I used a USB power bank. It's something that is used to usually to charge your iPhone, but they, at least the one that I bought, is very, very powerful. It's, I actually overkill my needs, just to be sure. I, I bought the most powerful I could buy on, on the web. Uh, but this is a, it's a simple USB power bank. And then you will need a 3G modem to allow Irene to be connected to the web, and so be connected to the rest of your architecture. So again, off-the-shelf components, you just buy them and combine together, and you end up in something like this. A Raspberry Pi with the shield in a nice case. You attach the speaker on the audio jack. You have the power uh, supply attached, and also you have um, the, US, the GPS USB receiver. So very easy to assemble and very easy to deploy, in my case, under the saddle. Um, just as a side note, being all external components, you don't need even to buy the, the warranty of uh, your new motorbike, which is good. Um, okay, good. So let's start on more details about the onboard computer now that we have the hardware, we assemble it together, and we deploy it. First thing, as I said, you start from a Raspberry Pi, and you attach it to it, your Sensat library. And the nice thing is that, uh, with the Sensat shield, sorry. And the nice thing is that this shield comes with some library that let you access the sensor installed on, the, uh, on this shield, on this Sensat shield. And on top of that, uh, there are a few additional software components on board. For example, the GPS daemon. This is a standard Linux component that allow you to read GPS uh, readings from serial GPS sensor, like the one uh, I, I show you uh, that goes through USB. And on top of this, I program basically a small Java web application with Spring Boot, nothing fancy, which is installed on the Raspberry Pi. And what it does is basically expose uh, a set of REST endpoints such that from the outside, you can query the onboard computer or you can set a resource on the onboard computer. For example, you can query the state of a sensor, right? You can query and you can say, oh, get me the temperature through a REST endpoint, and you will receive a JSON in this case um, that gives you the temperature, a few other details. And this is true for all the sensor that you want to read or all the services uh, that you want to set or update or, or again, read the information about those services. For example, you can get the status of the safety mode service. Again, with a get towards those REST endpoints, you will receive something like that, the status of the service, uh, the callback used when the safety mode is triggered, or the current mobile number uh, that is used for uh, sending the notification and timestamp and other stuff. Of course, not only you can read stuff from the vehicle, which is isolated behind this layer of REST API, but you can also uh, update resource on the vehicle, of course, using the put HTTP action verb, uh, in this case, you are, uh, you are overriding the resource related to the safety um, mode service. And, um, well, this way you end up in having a, a nice set of REST endpoints which isolate um, uh, the internal implementation of the onboard computer and they let you query and interact with it through a standard interface. So very, very simple. So the stack in the end on board is uh, Raspberry Pi, Sensat, few additional sensors like the GPS sensor. Then on top you have a Linux operating system which is, comes out of the box with Raspberry Pi. And on top of it you have some other libraries like GPSD for reading the GPS or the Sensat libraries to access the sensor. And on top uh, a custom made web API made in, uh, with Spring Boot in my case that expose everything through a standard layer of REST API. So this is very standard technology, nothing, uh, uh, nothing fancy, right? But we have few problems uh, that we need to address to uh, progress with the project with Irene. First, we need to let Irene speak, right? We said that Irene is gonna talk to me or to somebody else, not only through message, but even with live voice. So we need to allow this uh, software on board to be able to talk, right? And I did that by integrating it with Amazon Polly obtaining, in the end, something like that. So it's connected to the sensor. Well, we should have audio. He said, um, dude, as you saw in the video, dude, don't touch me. Um, what happens behind the scene is that the web app is connected to Amazon Polly, which is in turn connect through, uh, to the sensor, the accelerometer uh, on board of the Sensat library, such that if you shake the bike, touch the bike, or move the bike, you have uh, an audio message, as you saw in the video, right? 
And how you do that in, in Java, in my case, was pretty simple because you have the Java SDK for Poly. You create an Amazon Poly client. And um, what happens is that you just uh, invoke a, um, the method for synthesizing some speech which require the text that you want to synthesize, and you receive back an MP3. You just need to specify the kind of voice you want. In my case, it was a female voice, and I get the MP3 back, and I can play it using standard libraries to play MP3. So very simple. Um, just a trick here, uh, since you want to be fast in um, giving the output, the audio output, somebody touch a motorbike, a very good trick is to synthesize the sentence that you want to uh, speak before you cache the MP3 and then you play the MP3 on the fly once when you want. Just a little side trick. So, so very easy. We know that Irene is on board, is alive, he can, he can speak. We need, to, um, we need to be able to speak to Irene now, which is the second problem. We need to be able to reach from the outside that layer of REST API, right? Which is running on a Raspberry Pi on a vehicle somewhere in the world Connecting, connected to 3G. And the problem is that it is connected, but you have a private, you have, um, you have a private IP and is a dynamic IP, right? Uh, this is because uh, I use a standard SIM card, and in Italy, um, you cannot get the machine-to-machine -machine SIM card that offer you a public IP or a static IP, right? So you have these standard SIM cards that are uh, dynamic and, and private IP. And then it was a problem because dynamic DNS being uh, private IP is not enough to reach those REST API on the motorbike. So I did a bit of a hack in this case. Uh, basically what I did is that I set up a reverse SSH tunnel over 3G towards an EC2 instance in the cloud. Um, it's a very simple recipe, right? Uh, so basically you take an Amazon EC2 instance, you enable SSH port forwarding, and then you take and you attach to it an elastic IP, such that it's gonna be reachable from outside with a well-defined IP. And then on the Raspberry Pi, you configure a reverse SSH tunnel towards that elastic IP, which means that every connection to the AC2 will be forwarded in a, a, in a reverse, through the reverse tunnel to the motorbike, wherever the motorbike is in the world, no matter what IP you have, et cetera. Uh, two recommendations, first, Use, if you go for this way, which I don't recommend, use auto SSH, because this way over 3G, if you lose connection, signal is not there, the connection will be automatically reestablished. So very, very resilient. And second recommendation is, well, this is a kind of hack, right? Uh, I did it to make it work, I did it to make it work fast. What I recommend is, well, maybe you can take a look to AWS Greengrass, that if you have an hardware which is compatible to that, you can use to have a kind of similar setting, okay? And second advice, uh, build your infrastructure with cloud formation such that every time you rebuild it will be, will be automatically built. Okay, so given that, we know that we can let Irene speak and we can reach Irene from the outside, right? So if you go back to the architecture, you will know that uh, we solved the left part and we solve also uh, the vehicle proxy, which is DC2, which is a proxy in the cloud of the rest endpoints on the vehicle. We now have to um, discuss about the chatbot. So why I chose to do a chatbot? Chatbot is part of what is called a conversational interface. Uh, originally, interfaces uh, between the human and the computer were like uh, called CLI, right? common line interfaces, first, gener first generation of interfaces. Basically, there's a medium that translates what do you want into a language that the machine understands, like commands in a CLI, or punch cards in a very old-fashioned system. Then the second generation was uh, a graphical user interface, so there is a more friendly way to interact with machine, mouse, window-based uh, interfaces. And then what is called the third generation is natural user interfaces, so you interact with machine in a very natural way through voice, through messages over text, through gestures, like HAL in 9001, nine whatever, I don't remember. Nine, uh, yeah, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey, the robot there. Um, and this is the official reason. I chose to do a chatbot because it's a very natural way to interact with the system. The non-official reason is that I'm really bad at designing interface, so chatbot was perfect because I need to rely on Facebook Messenger and it just work. I don't need to design any interface. So, but what is, in this case, Amazon, Amazon Lex, which is the component, the service that I used 
to uh, build the chatbot. So first, it's a, it's a managed service by Amazon uh, which comes with Latin, natural language understanding and speech recognition. Um, it offers a few being a managed service scalability and availability out of the box, so things that you don't need to care about. Then it comes with some off-the-shelf integrations with existing messaging platform, so for example, Facebook. And um, it has versioning and aliasing, which is, means that you can support multiple versions of your chatbot, which matches your development stream, such that if you make some mistake, you can go back to preview version. And the same for aliases. So you can have prod chatbot, test chatbot, staging chatbot, whatever. So very useful, and there's other integration that can be useful, but they are not relevant for this project. So, but let's go deeper. So let's take the safety mode scenario of the Irene project. So uh, everything starts with the user that says, oh, please turn the safety mode on, right? And then you have, well, uh, the chatbot replying, enter a phone number to send the text notification, then the user enter it, and then the chatbot says, oh, are you sure? It's confirmation you want it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I say yes. And then final confirmation, everything was fine. I set the safety mode on. So let's specify some jargon here to let understand each other. First, um, this is an intent. So the user wanted something from our chatbot, right? This is called intent. The, 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 the flow of conversation is basically user invoking intent towards our chatbot. And uh, it does, the user does that by uh, typing utterances. Utterances are spoken or typed phrases uh, that invoke your intent, are the sentences used by the user to invoke the intent that he wants, okay? And then you have slots. Slots are pieces of information provided by the user that are required to fulfill the intent. For example, the mobile number. And then you have uh, fulfillment, which is actually the mechanism, the action performed to fulfill an intent triggered by the user. So this is the basic jargon that we need to use to develop a chatbot uh, with Amazon Lex. Let's take a closer look. Uh, let's start from utterances. So you may have, as you saw in the video, many possible utterances. You may have, for example, where are you? You may have turning the alarm, alarm on. You may have, what is the temperature outside? You may have, uh, how is the weather outside? You may have, uh, turn the safety mode off, right? And these are custom utterances specific to our project, but also you may have uh, standard um, purpose, general purpose utterances like cancel, right, or help. And, but the nice thing about utterances that you need to grasp is that for the same intent that you want to trigger, you may have multiple utterances, right? Because for the positioning, to get the position of the motor, of the motorbike, you can ask where are you, or you can ask where are you parked, or you can ask where is the vehicle, or where did I park, right? And the nice thing of Amazon Lex is that you provide samples, a set of samples of utterances, and Lex will build a model out of that, being able to recognize all the possible, sam all the possible utterances related to this intent, right? So it's, it's a learning process that Lex, Lex does for you. Very, very uh, useful and interesting. Second things, slots. Uh, are the pieces of data that the user must provide to fulfill an intent? Like if you order pizza, the kind of pizza. If you book a travel, where, where you want to go? Um, they have a type because they could be general string or they could be, for example, Amazon specific types like day of the week or email address, right? And they, can, and they will have values, right, provided by the user. So these are slots. And if you go to the Amazon console, you will see that everything starts by providing samples of utterances to Lex, such that he starts building the model, able to recognize when the user will type something similar to this stuff. And the second thing is that you provide slots. You give a slot a name, you, in this case mobile, a type, which is mobile, is a custom type that I create to recognize mobile number. And then you also provide a prompt. So what the, the chatbot should ask to elicit that piece of information from the user. In this case, please enter mobile number to send text notification, blah, 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 okay? And the last part, as I told you before, is that you need, sooner or later, when you recognize an intent, and you fill up all the slots. You need to fulfill it. And in Amazon Lex, you do that by triggering 
by, by providing a lambda function and, by, and Lex will trigger it when the uh, fulfillment needs to occur. In this case, I set up my, uh, this um, intent to call Irene set safety lambda, uh, my lambda Irene set safety, okay? So given that, let's take for a second a look to the Amazon, uh, ar sorry, to the Lex architecture. There is Amazon Lex, which contains natural, understand, natural language understanding capabilities and speech recognition, as I told you. There are your set of Lambda, and they do both fulfillment, but also validation. If you want to validate some input from the user, you can provide a custom Lambda that does the validation uh, for you. And then you interact with it at least through the console, as I show you, or as usual through the SDK. Okay? So the last piece of, uh, that we need to take a look is the a closer look to the fulfillment and validation. And as I told you, it is performed by providing Lambda, uh, Amazon Lambda implementation. So a snippet of code that you upload to Amazon. And everything works like that. So basically the user interacts with the messaging platform that forward the message to Lex. Lex does the, uh, Lex does the uh, recognition of the intent, ask for the slots if necessary. When fulfillment needs to occur, invokes your Lambda. He also invokes your Lambda if you provide one for validation, okay? And in the case of the positioning, the Lambda, what does it, what does it do? It connect with the EC2, which is the proxy of the vehicle in the cloud. It asks for the uh, positioning endpoint. It receives the GPS positioning of the vehicle and able to craft a response that ends up to the user. Okay, we'll take a closer look at the details later. So what is Lambda, I told you, is a snippet of code that you need to upload to Amazon to run uh, when it's necessary uh, to have the fulfillment uh, to occur. It's, an implement it's the AWS implementation of function as a service, so it's basically a method that you upload to Amazon. It's typically using serverless architecture because you provide the code that you don't care about the underlying servers, right? It's completely serverless. So this is a way to implement serverless chatbot. And um, yeah, usual benefits, uh, being a managed service, you have scalability and availability managed for you. Very nice is that you have many integration with other AWS services, for example, Lex, also API Gateway, for example. And on top of that is pays as you go. So you don't pay by the hour, if you, like if you rent an EC2, but you pay only per invocation, only if you use it. Very convenient in this case. Um, okay, good. So how, how this actually in reality? In reality, this is Java code. It's a method, so you need to uh, implement a certain interface that forces you to implement a certain method. And this is the lambda that I use to retrieve the position of the motorbike. First line of the method is retrieve the position from the EC2 uh, proxy on the cloud of the vehicle. So it's a rest endpoint. I do a get and I get the position. I parse it. I do some, I add some weather forecast given the position such that to, to craft a nice message back to the user. Uh, and then I, using some Lex API, I just send the message back to Lex to reply, okay? So very simple, uh, just a method and it's gonna stay in the cloud and will be invoked only when the user type, where are you? This is recognized as a position intent. The fulfillment is this lambda, it reaches the vehicle and you have the answer back, very easy. So let's go back to the architecture. We did the left part, which is the onboard computer, the text-to-speech capabilities, GPS is just a sensor, everything is is organized um, uh, through, is ex uh, exposed on the cloud through a proxy, basically, EC2 proxy through that trick that I told you before. Then we have the chatbot, which is the central engine of this project, which basically is able to recognize utterances and invoke fulfillment and validate inputs when necessary. And this fulfillment with um, query the endpoints, REST endpoints, to retrieve information from the vehicles or set new, new services or new settings of the service on the vehicle, we need to explore the, um, the, the right part of the architecture, how to actually integrate Lex with the standard messaging platform, right? Platforms like uh, uh, Facebook, Slack, and Skype, uh, Skype for example. Um, so this is the next step, the next problem that you need to face if you want to implement this. How to connect messaging platform with, Le with Lex? You have two ways, at least two ways. A simple one that I didn't follow as usual, and a more yeah, weird one that I followed. The simple one is that basically, as I told you before, Lex come with some integration of the shelf 
with standard messaging platform like uh, Facebook, right? So if you go to the Lex um, console dashboard, you can configure a channel. You can select, for example, Facebook. You need to go to Facebook as well to create a Facebook app because your chatbot is gonna be a Facebook app. And when you create a Facebook app, you will receive some tokens, some page asset tokens, some app secret key stuff. You fill it up here, and they two will be connected together. So after that, if somebody write a message to your uh, Facebook bot on Facebook, he will, this message will be forwarded to Lex. Lex will take care about um, understanding it. It will trigger event, uh, potential fulfillment, and the fulfillment will give an answer back that Lex will give to Facebook, and the reply will reach the user. So very simple. This is, however, the simple way to do it that I couldn't follow for a, a specific reason. At the time in which I was programming this, it was only possible to do reactive messages, which means that you can write something to the bot and the, the bot will reply to you, right, as a reaction. But I want also bot able to be a proactive because if somebody touches the motorbike, the bot needs to send you a message proactively, even if you never chat with it, or at least in the recent time, so a proactive message. And to do that, um, there is a way. There is a way to do it. Uh, it. This is, again, a slide concerning the Lex architecture. And as you can see, there are two ways to interact with the Lex. Way number one is through the console or the SDK, and through that you can uh, create a chatbot, as I, I, saw you, I showed you before in previous slides. You can create utterances, create slots, you can do the same with the SDK. But Lex, uh, Amazon Lex also exposed some REST API, which is the second way in which you can interact with the Lex, and you can use them to uh, speak with your chatbot. So you can post content to your chatbot through this REST API, and you will receive a reply from the chatbot uh, as a response to this API invocation. And this is the way in which I did it. So basically, uh, there is, as I said, a REST endpoint that you can use to post some text in my case. Can, I think you can even, some speech can be, but in my case, some text. In this case, please set the alarm on to my bot, which is Irene, to my alias, which is production in that case, if it's the real system. And you can also attach a user ID to uni, un, um, identify, identify univocally your um, conversation, because you may have multiple user interacting with your bot, of course. And you can also add some session attribute to um, keep some uh, conversational context during the conversation, right? So basically what I did is that I code a, a Lambda expression that used this API, and every time I invoke this Lambda expression, this will send a message uh, to Lex, right, uh, for example. And what happens is that, um, yeah, it's basically Java code that you upload and we use this uh, API to interact with the, uh, with the bot. So basically you need, however, three, three key ingredients to make everything work. As I told you before, you need Lambda because you need to code the access to, to those Lex API first. You need API gateway because you need to expose on the web your Lambda through, uh, behind the REST endpoint such that um, you can invoke from the REST endpoint your code that will talk with the Lex, okay? And we'll, 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 that code will use the right format with the Lex, and from the outside you just spoke the REST endpoint. And I will tell you more on why I need it. It's and actually needed because of the third ingredient. I use one of the many services that uh, allow you to integrate with many messaging platforms at once. For example, Microsoft Bot Framework in my case, allow me to, inter to integrate with Skype, Slack and Facebook just implementing an interface towards their API. So it's just a medium to interface to multiple channels at, one, at once. So we, by combining these ingredients, you can run some code that talk to Microsoft Bot Framework to send messages. And by uh, hooking a Lambda behind an API gateway, you can let the Microsoft Bot Framework calls you when a message comes to one of your uh, Skype, Facebook, or Slack uh, contact receive a message. So let's take um, first a brief detour because I mentioned API gateway, but I never told you uh, what an API gateway is. So API gateway is another managed services by Amazon, which is a fully managed service that makes it easy for developer to create, publish, maintain, and monitor uh, secure API. 
And being a managed service, again, you have scalability and availability out of the box. You don't need to care about this stuff. Very, very useful stuff, very useful stuff. Third thing is that it integrates with other AWS component, and we are gonna use it because we are gonna integrate with AWS Lambda. So the pattern is create an API gateway that exposes an endpoint and attach a Lambda behind it, okay? And for key thing is again pay per use. So you can create as many endpoints uh, that you want and you're gonna pay per use, so very convenient again. It, it really matches uh, the paradigm of um, AWS Lambda, which is again pay per use. So how do you do that? How do you do that? You end up in the API Gateway Console. This is um, a screen that shows you um, how to create, a, in this case, a POST endpoint uh, for um, sending messages um, to, um, to, to the bot, to, sorry, to the customer uh, that wrote you something. If you want, for example, to contact the, customer, the user and say, oh, somebody touched me, you will invoke this endpoint, which in turn will invoke a par um, particular uh, Lambda uh, function, which is configured into the API Gateway console because they are integrated. You can tell um, API Gateway, oh, when the endpoint is invoked, take the payload and give it to that Lambda. This will do the work of the API for you. This is what happens behind the scene. And that Lambda, Irene messaging, is basically uh, the Lambda that will uh, contact the bot framework for sending a message, okay? So let's look at this through an animation because it's much, much, uh, probably much, much more uh, clear. So let's assume that the user wants to send a message, like where are you? What happens is that the message is actually typed into one of the channels. But those channels, the contact that the user is using is actually a bot, a Facebook app. And the Facebook app has been configured to forward that to my uh, account on Microsoft Bot Framework, which is in turn configured to hit my webhook which is basically an endpoint exposed through uh, API Gateway. Uh, but as I told you before, the API Gateway is just a proxy that will forward my uh, invocation to some code of mine, which is a serverless Lambda code, right? And this is the code that knows how to use the Lex API to forward the message to Lex, which does the magic for me, and we recognize uh, what does where are you means and it, it recognized that this belongs to the position um, intent. And since fulfillment can occur, because I configure a lambda for fulfilling the position intent, well, Lex will invoke my lambda for the position fulfillment. And what this lambda does, actually, is gonna invoke my rest endpoint in the cloud, which is a proxy of the rest endpoint uh, on the vehicle, right? And this proxy will actually contact the vehicle and ask for the endpoint uh, regarding the position, which means consulting the GPS satellites, retrieving the position, and then the message goes back all the way back to the user crafted as a nice response. And along the way, I also do some reverse geocoding such that the GPS coordinates are translated in actual uh, human-friendly address and also in, in, in together with the link on Google Map. And the message goes back to the user, and the user will see it, and the user is happy, and blah, blah, blah. This is an example of reactive, um, reactive message. I told you before that with this kind of setting, you can also send proactive message from your bot to the user. For example, imagine that you have the Irene parked with the alarm trigger, uh, set up and uh, able to be triggered, right? So if somebody touched the vehicle, um, the first thing that happened is that um, Polly will, the, the text synthesized by Polly will speak loud and say, oh, somebody touched me, uh, as you saw in the video. And the second thing that happens is that a message is actually triggered from the Raspberry Pi to a, to a Lambda, actually going through an API gateway again, because this, this Lambda is exposed on the web. And this uh, Lambda is in charge of contacting the bot framework and telling to him, oh, look, go to the user and tell him that somebody touched me, tell him this text and so the message goes to the channel and is received by the user. So this is an example of proactive message implemented uh, this way. So, um, yeah, so far, I think we saw almost everything um, related to the onboard computer, how to do the fulfillment and validation through Lex, and how to interface with multiple channels uh, in at least two ways. And plus, we saw that I, I was using other third-party API like open weather, Google Maps, or places, 
and SCABY for uh, SMS notification. By the way, you can use also Amazon SNS for this. Um, but it's important, in my opinion, to take a, a step back for a second uh, because we saw the wall, ar wall architecture, but this was just a POC, right? It's important to step back for a second and see what could they have done better, right? First, security. I didn't talk about security for a very simple reason. There is no security. I didn't implement it. <laughs> so for sure you can do better. Here there is some, just some HTTPS here and there. Uh, I recommend to take a look to Amazon Cognito to uh, implement security. Could be a very good choice. Uh, because it fits very easily with the rest of the pieces of the architecture. Second, power. You saw everything is uh, powered by huge, huge, yeah, decently big USB power bank, which is clearly an overkilling in that case. I just want to be sure. I recommend for a solution like that, that you, you hook yourself up to the battery of the motorbike, and then as a fallback, uh, you have a LiPo battery. Be careful with those on board, okay, as a fallback. Third, in the architecture, there are a couple of hacks, okay? First of all, that thing about the reverse um, SSH tunnel, mm, a bit shaky. For sure, you can do better. Uh, I recommend you uh, to check AWS IoT and, in particular, Greengrass to do that, okay? Third thing, also the hardware was great for a first prototype, but nothing that you can go for a beta version or even commercial one. You can take a look online for many alternative platforms. I can mention, for example, uh, Particle Hardware is very good for implementing IoT solution like this one. Uh, that is gonna save a lot of efforts doing this kind of dedicated hardware instead of a general purpose or Raspberry Pi. Some takeaways uh, before I finish the session. Uh, first, uh, we saw what we, what we learned, what, what I learned as well when doing this project, how to use Lex how to build um, an Amazon uh, Lex chatbot, a serverless one. Uh, how can you implement this, um, the code using AWS Lambda? Um, as we saw, is the fast implementation of the AWS. We saw a bit of API gateway to expose your serverless code as a REST API online. Uh, and we also saw uh, how to combine that with some kind of embedded IoT device installed on whatever, in my uh, motorbike in this case. Uh, we also saw at least a couple of ways to integrate with uh, standard messaging platforms, um, Facebook, whatever, the normal way and more um, articulated way, let's say. And yeah, this is, I think, uh, what you could consider the takeaways ways of this uh, session. And um, yeah, I need to um, say thank you uh, to my dear friend Paul. Uh, that helped me doing this project, and also to Irene, my real girlfriend, that she was very patient for the nights that spent coding. Um, if you want to know more about the project or if I will uh, work on that for further development, please follow me on Twitter. And if you have questions, I will be right outside the, uh, the room. Um, thank you so much.